interviewing the judge who was extremely knowledgeable and innovative and interesting. But when we asked him a question about capacity, um, so we asked him, judge, you know, how do you actually make the, this difficult determination that someone lacks capacity, you know, functional capacity, cognitive capacity, and, you know, whatever the state's definition of capacity is and actually needs, needs a guardian. And he kind of got this look on his face and he said, well, I feel it. I, I feel it. I feel it. He said, and I didn't look at Naomi. Naomi didn't look at me. We didn't look at each other until we got out of that building when we could laugh our heads off. Welcome to the NCA's podcast, Conversations on Aging and Justice, your trusted source for the latest in news, research, and policy in elder justice. The NCEA is excited to introduce the OGs of Elder Justice series, where you'll hear trailblazers in the field share their passions, joys, collaborations, frustrations, and innovations, or any combination thereof in elder justice through informal and candid conversations. Guardianship is a relationship created by state law in which a court gives an individual or entity the legal authority to make personal and or property decisions for someone whom the court finds cannot make decisions for themselves. While guardianship aims to protect vulnerable individuals, it may also remove fundamental rights such as the right to contract, marry, control assets, and make medical decisions. While guardianship can safeguard against elder abuse, it may also be a source of abuse when guardians exceed the scope of their authority. In this episode, Erica Wood and Naomi Karp seasoned lawyers and policy experts in law, aging, and guardianship take us on a journey through their remarkable 35-year friendship and collaborations. From working together for 17 years at the American Bar Association to embarking on countless road trips to explore the intricacies of guardianship, healthcare decision-making, and dispute resolution, Naomi and Erica have, in their own words, flunked retirement and stand out as true pioneers in the realm of law and aging. Naomi and I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be an OG and to do kind of a look back in time at some of the things that we've done together as a team because it's been many, many years and sort of how that fits into the larger elder justice picture. So Naomi, it's been so many years and such a long time do you want to start by sort of talking a little bit about how you came to be in the elder justice field in the first place? Sure. And how we met and got started. So I went to law school in Boston, and then I um, wanted to do public interest law, really work to, you know, work for social justice. So I was a legal services lawyer for low-income and older people for about 10 years, and part of that time exclusively for older people. And then because of some things going on with my family, I found out that I would be moving to D.C., and I ran into Nancy Coleman, who was the staff director of the American Bar Association Commission on Law and Aging. I had met her before. And I said, I just found out I'm moving to Washington. And she said, oh, I may have a job for you. And it actually worked out. And I said, I don't want to work full time because I have a toddler. And she said, that might be great. Anyway, turns out Erica was already at the ABA, had been there for, I think, seven years and also had kids and wasn't working full time. So the first thing I was told was, you're going to share an office with Erica Wood. And you'll be there on different days. The first thing I learned about Erica was that she was always cold because I would walk into the office a day after Erica had been there and the heat would be turned way up and I'd have to turn it down. So I was like, who is this Erica Wood who's always cold? <laughs> and that was how we first met. <laughs> I, I guess when I look back, I was always interested in aging from my childhood and from the very beginning, always had kind of a, a sense of injustice, like, oh, yeah, how can this be? And so I knew kind of that I wanted to gear in that direction, but 
Um, and that's partly why I went to law school. But of course, when I got out of law school, there was no elder law field. There was no elder justice. And so I didn't know what to do. I went to one of my law professors and he directed me over to the National Council of Senior Citizens that had just gotten a grant from what's now ACL and to promote legal resources for older people. What an idea. And after six years there, during which time I worked with the young lawyers, I volunteered as a, then I was a young lawyer, to promote resources for older people. And that's how I came into the orbit of the American Bar Association, ultimately came to be at the ABA at the same time as Naomi, where we you know, shared pro many, many projects for 17 years. One of the amazing things about our career is that Although we did work for the same organization for 17 years, I then went on to work at two other places. I was at AARP's Public Policy Institute, and then when the new federal agency, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, opened and was going to start an office for older Americans, I went there. So I moved around a bit. And now for the past few years, Erica and I are both sort of not really retired, semi-retired, but... We flunked. We flunked retirement. We flunked retirement. And throughout all of those job changes, Erica and I continued to work together at each place. We did joint projects at the ABA. When I was at AARP, I could fund Erica and the ABA, and we did some great studies on guardianship monitoring residential decision-making and guardianship and, and some other things. And then even at the CFPB, we were able to work together on creating the Managing Someone Else's Money Guides, which are for agents under powers of attorney and guardians and others who have fiduciary responsibilities to older people with some kind of diminished capacity. So now here we are still, we're doing projects together for the National Center on Elder Abuse, which we love. It's really been amazing that we've had these interests and have been able to keep collaborating through these, I think, 35 years. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And each of those projects, of course, calls for bunches of memories, both substantive as far as what we learned about those that subject matter and how we were or were not able to push forward on those issues, some of them being very difficult. But also, you know, they all had their, their stories and their funny moments and Naomi mentioned the Managing Someone Else's Money Guides, which was Naomi's terrific idea. And she was able to get a CFPB funding for the ABA to do those guides. Erica and her colleagues for a while were thinking about calling the guides, it's not your money, which was really a great theme because that's what we really were telling fiduciaries. Remember, it's not your money. It's someone else's money, and you have high duties of care. And so we loved that title, but sadly we thought, well, we need something a little bit more positive and not so, <laughs> so scoldy. So they were, were not the it's not your money guides. <laughs> but maybe they should have been. I don't know. One thing, Erica, that I always think about when I'm trying to reminisce and especially trying to think about the things that were fun and funny and quirky were all the traveling we did. Erica and I took a lot of road trips, or I should say airplane trips, which were then followed by road trips, which were then followed again by airplane trips. After a while, we realized a lot of our trips were taking us to state capitals. So we started a custom of we would go in front of the state capitol building and we would, I guess it was before the time of selfies, so we must have, you know, had colleagues who had just stopped people on the street and said, will you take a picture of us? And we still have some of those pictures of us standing in front of Capitol. So it's always a building with a dome. And I can't tell what state they're from anymore, but it's like, oh, there's another one of our state Capitol trips. And, and we went in many of them. And, and I think that all this happened because uh, a lot of our projects, whether they were in guardianship or Initially, we did an awful lot of work in mediation and dispute resolution in, in addition to issues of surrogate decision-making and, and guardianship. But many of them had pilot projects or interviews or focus groups that were some kind of site visit. 
a lot of the country looked the same, but a lot of it looked different. We, you know, were in the mountains in Boise, Idaho, and we were in Lansing, Michigan, where it was pretty flat. And, oh, we were in Des Moines, Iowa, where we heard that a big blizzard was coming and we wanted to get out of there as fast as we could. So we canceled a meeting and ran to the airport. Our plane had to get de-iced twice before we could take off. And then we had to make a connection in Minneapolis. Erica remembers how we just tore across that airport as fast as we could so we wouldn't miss our plane and panting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Finally got to the gate where they were about to close the door on us. That one definitely sticks out. I, yeah, I don't think I've ever run so fast in an airport. And then some of the funny things are actually interesting, substantive things. So we had a guardianship monitoring project where we had four different, different site visits. And my goodness, did we learn a lot on those site visits and we kind of built on all the wonderful work that Sally Harvey had done in back in uh, 1991 with her steps to sustain or promote guardianship monitoring. And kind of, I hope that our report from that, which was 2007, um, served as a stepping stone for some of the work that's being done now by the National Center for State Courts and that's being funded by the Administration for Community Living in the State Elder Justice Guardianship Grants. But anyway... We were in New York, and they had a very interesting court called the uh, the Guardianship Part. In, in New York, they call various kinds of courts guardian uh, parts. And it was a demonstration of a kind of a holistic guardianship um, court that was to that was to connect guardianship with other court related problems in the person's life, like somebody might get be getting a divorce or someone something. We were interviewing the judge, who was extremely knowledgeable and innovative and interesting. But when we asked him a question about capacity, um, so we asked him, Judge, you know, how do you actually make the, this difficult determination that someone lacks capacity, you know, functional capacity, cognitive capacity, and, you know, whatever the state's definition of capacity is and actually needs, needs a guardian? And he kind of got this look on his face and he said, well, I feel it. I I feel it. I feel it. He said, and I didn't look at Naomi. Naomi didn't look at me. We didn't look at each other until we got out of that building when we could laugh our heads off because it just was. And of course, it's very troubling to say to say the least. But um, it was also funny at the time. <laughs> yeah, the contradiction of that they were doing this very forward thinking thing. But then when it came to probably the most critical question about guardianship and due process rights and all of that, he could feel it. <laughs> There's so many, but another one that sticks in my mind, we were doing another project. It was really one of my favorite of all the projects we did together. And the project was called the Healthcare Decision Making for the Unbefriended Elderly, which of course we would probably use different language now, but it was really about how do you make healthcare decisions without resorting to guardianship for people who had no named surrogates and clearly lacked capacity. And we again we were looking at what are those innovations, what are those pilots around the country? to deal with this thorny problem and that could be dealing with a mundane matter or it could be dealing with a life or death question for someone who is really the most vulnerable. And New York State had a program. It was called something like the surrogate decision-making panels or surrogate decision-making committees where they actually appointed a group of several knowledgeable citizens who would sit almost as a court or hearing officers and hear specific cases, many of them involved profoundly disa developmentally disabled people who needed things like dental work under anesthesia or a routine medical procedure, but there was no one to consent. And this particular project was on the grounds of a longstanding state mental hospital called the Creedmoor Institution, which I used to drive past as a kid all the time. It was a very scary looking place and it was an old institution. And Erica and I had been traveling and then we would be going on to traveling again that night. And she reminded me the hearings were held in one of the buildings 
And we had our little wheelie suitcases with us. So we were being walked across the campus of this mental institution, pulling our suitcases behind us. And we, we looked like here we were new inmates or new residents at the mental hospital. And it was kind of funny and, and weird. But no, we were really just public interest lawyers, always on the hunt for the latest thing. And the, we went to what I thought were actually very dignified hearings where the profoundly impacted person who couldn't understand the procedure still, he or she was present and had an advocate, and they went through the facts and they made a reasoned decision. And that was very encouraging, and that was a model that we that we wrote up. Yeah, that was a, it was wonderful to be able to, to see that hearing, and it was worth uh, the whole trip just to just to see that. And in the guide, the book that came out. Unbefri we don't use that word anymore, but unbefriended elders. You know, we set out four or five ba basic pathways that states used, and and some of them, uh, you know, were very progressive and interesting, and and are still in use. Could be adapted by by other states, and I think there's much more to be done in that whole area. Now, some of our work in guardianship was right in our own backyards because. The District of Columbia, of course, had its own guardianship system, and it had it had a panel of in cases where where there was a need for a guardian of last resort, or as some people say, a golar, um, and nobody was available and willing and qualified to serve. A panel of attorneys serves, and D.C. still has that. And there was a group that a group of advocates that came together around the idea that wait a minute, attorneys don't always make the best guardians. Let's face it, they're not trained for that. Yes, they're trained for the money part of it and, you know, the accountability part and so on. But as far as some of the substantive decision making, um, a social worker and some of the communication, a social worker or a nurse or best of all, perhaps an occupational therapist would be good. And so this group fought like the Dickens and met with the D.C. court to try to open up the panel to nurses, occupational therapists, and uh, social workers. In other words, non-lawyers. We did actually convince the D.C. court to open up the panel, believing there are still very, very few non-lawyers on the panel, so steps are slow. The other thing we did in that project that was or related to that project also in D.C. that I thought was very progressive and I got to participate in it was there were cases where a guardian or a court itself had to make a complicated bioethical decision, whether it was an end of life or, or a procedure where there was some disagreement about whether or not you know, what the correct medical choice would be. And we had panels of three professionals. Again, they were interdisciplinary. And the court could invite the panel to go interview all the stakeholders and then make a report that would help guide the court in deciding what healthcare decision should be made. And I can remember a couple of those cases. I can remember going to Howard University Hospital for a man who needed a feeding tube, and his family was insisting they didn't like the chemical stuff that would be given to this man, and they wanted to be able to give him fresh fruits and vegetables and grind it up themselves to go in his feeding tube. And, you know, was that something that was medically appropriate? We didn't know. We had to go learn about that. And I remember going to D.C. General Hospital where someone didn't want to have dialysis and had to help make those decisions. So Although we worked on huge policy questions that were very removed from people, we also worked on things where we really got in there with the people and helped on individual cases, but those were cases that could have a lot of impact on other people and on their lives. Erica, I wanted to mention more lighthearted things about our trips because these are things that always come to my mind. One of it was sort of part of that universal road trip, which was we would fly somewhere, and then usually we had to go to hard, harder to get to places, so we'd rent a car. And Erica, I know she won't mind if I tease her a little bit about this. Driving is not her forte. Not In my fact, friend. she does drive, and she, you know, was kind of the usual soccer mom driving her kids around. All the but no left turns. No, no left turns. turns. Somehow she got around her city of Arlington, Virginia, from one place to another without making any left turns, and she didn't really like driving anywhere else. 
And yeah. somehow we always got where we had to go. Oh, we but did. But it was funny. The other thing, the ABA and some other entities had a very important conference this quite a while ago now. 1991. Um, okay, 1991. It was about court-related needs of the elderly and people with disabilities. And it was bringing together aging and disability advocates and people from the courts from all over the country. And we happened to have this conference in a hotel in Reno, Nevada. And there were two things that I really remember about that hotel. First of all, it was Nevada and it was Reno. So of course there was gambling. So the first floor of the hotel was a giant gambling casino and you couldn't get anywhere to the lobby or your room or anywhere without walking through the casino. And I'm sure some of us use those slot machines, but it was just a bizarre thing to be doing a very important conference on a serious subject, but always be walking through and seeing people pulling the levers and watching the little apples and cherries come up on the on the slot machine. <laughs> of course, there were some serious things that we had. Um, people might remember Judy Human. She was a very, very dedicated and famous disability advocate, and she's been featured in some films. She was at our conference, and she pointed out that actually the hotel where we were having the conference, not all the rooms were accessible. People with in wheelchairs or with mobility impairments couldn't actually easily get on their own from one place to another, and they made a big stink about it. And here, I think we felt really embarrassed, you know, how could we do this? We were focusing on making courts more accessible, and even our conference wasn't. So that was a learning experience, too. Yeah, and that was a, that was a good report and a good set of recommendations, which actually passed through, was approved by the ABA House of Delegates and distributed widely. But you know how things are cyclic, and I think that uh, you know this has gone in waves, and that there's rising and falling attention to these issues of how can we make courts more age friendly, friendly to people with disabilities, and it's not just accessible, but actually more usable and open in in all different ways. And we followed that conference with um how to make juries more open and accessible. So uh, that that's one example of, of something that we did that we did a lot of guardianship work, but we did a lot of other work too. And particularly in the early days, we worked a lot on various aspects of mediation and dispute resolution. And I always loved that area because it has to do with people's voice. You know, what do people really want? What do they really need? What's their real story? And mediation is, as the mediators say, to, to uncover the real needs and desires behind the state in positions. So I always had a strong preference for mediation. Of course, I know that that has to be paired with good legal muscle. But we did a number of things. For example, we explored how nursing homes might use dispute resolution to to look at a process for a resolution of care conflicts, that doesn't always work, of course, but in, in some cases it could. We, for, for about 15 years, maybe more, we brought together a group of interesting stakeholders in something we called the Dispute Resolution Coalition on Aging and Disability, where every other month we had a wonderful speaker, very informative and looked at various, various aspects of ways to use mediation to really enhance the voice of people who are older and people who have disabilities in all of these different aspects. And then we, yes, turned that into a road trip by getting a, a grant from the Hewlett Foundation on how to bring together stakeholders in communities all over the country. So that was another one. So, Erica, I guess... We could probably go on for hours more, but we need to wrap up. I want to pose the important question to you that many of us will answer through these podcasts. Can you give one example of a key principle that guides you both professionally and personally? Yeah, Naomi, that's kind of a heavy question. Uh, but I did think about it, and it took me back to many years ago when in my family, we used to make New Year's resolutions every year, and we'd all say what our New Year's resolution was. And 
mine was always the same, and my kids would kid me to no end. I said that there was an ancient emperor named Marcus Aurelius, and a quote from Emperor Marcus Aurelius was, live, live as on a mountaintop with far-reaching outlook. And I always liked that, and I always took it to heart. And to me, it means sort of, you know, look at the big picture and think, you know, how, how do I want this to end up going down the road? Not just this step, but the overall benefits to people in need or whatever the, whatever the universe, the particular elder justice universe is, and how that relates to all of the things that other people in the elder justice universe are doing. Because obviously a lot of the important nursing home work is related to guardianship and it's all has many interconnections. And I also have always had, and Naomi knows this, a penchant for working at the, the national, state, and local levels sort of simultaneously because they inform each other and they better enable me to look with that far-reaching outlook. So that, that big picture kind of thing is, is one thing that guides me. How about you, Naomi? So I thought about it, and I guess I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to say I have two, but they go hand in hand. So it's kind of one. The first principle is help the people in greatest need. There are so many extreme needs. Some that resonated for me were, um, first of all, poverty, which is what led me into legal services and representing low-income people, and also limitations imposed on people by disability. And that was what led me to focus, especially on diminished or capacity or incapacity, and thus my work on guardianship, healthcare decision making, and advanced planning so that people can exercise as much autonomy as possible. And then the second one that goes hand in hand with that is try to help in the most impactful way. And that's why I got interested in large scale advocacy, such as impact litigation and policy and education, because these are interventions with the biggest bang for the buck and doing it that way whenever possible. So I think we have a lot of commonalities there in our, in our guiding principles, and maybe that's part of why we worked so, so well and had so much fun together over the years. I think so. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the OGs of Elder Justice series. In our next installment, we'll highlight the impactful elder justice collaborations and contributions of Jira psychologist, Dr. Bonnie Olson, and attorney and former prosecutor, Candace Heisler. Mm -hmm.